Our reading tonight is from John 12, 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with them. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have a quarrel with you, but you do not always have me. This is the word of God for the people of God. series, the Beatitudes, uh, kind of taking a look at the seven deadly sins and the Beatitudes and how, oh, probably 1,500 years ago, a bunch of theologians sat in some room that was probably a lot warmer and stickier than here right now, and they decided that uh, when Jesus was giving his sermon, the one and only sermon that he gave, um, this is what he was talking about. He was saying, watch out for these seven deadly things, and they're going to get you. And I think we've all walked through it this last seven weeks so far, right? And every one of us have had that stinger moment. Amen? Yeah? All right. So you guys all ready for another doobie dooby down sermon? <laughs> yes? All right. I'm telling you, after last week, you guys look like I shot you. <laughs> so just quiet. Didn't want to say anything. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to tell you that my mom always said age. We have more than enough. She'd always say, H, we had more than enough. And I would think at her and, and look inside the refrigerator and say, uh, obviously she's not seeing the same thing I'm seeing. Uh, you, know, you know what I'm saying, right? When you pour the cereal and go to get the milk and there's no milk, right? You know what I'm saying? But you still have a bowl of cereal poured. I'm the guy who can't eat the cereal unless there's milk. Now my brother, he just eat the cereal. But so I'd always look and say, wait a minute, Mom, it doesn't look like there's more than enough. And then when we would go other places and I'd watch these friends have stuff and then I would go, well, I kind of, I would like to have that gun or that bicycle and stuff. She would say, H, there's always more than enough. Always more than enough. And then there would be times, oh, God bless her heart. She would make me give it up. You know what I'm saying? Like I had my Snickers bar and then she'd say, give it to that person because they need it. And then I'm the one going, no, it's my Snickers bar. All right? used to be actually what they call baby root candy bar. I don't know if you've ever had that. I would fight over one of those bad boys. And so she was going, no, there's more than enough. If we need, we'll get more. And so that was always what she would say. There's more than enough, more than enough, more than enough. But I'm being honest in life, and I don't know about you, but I don't feel that way. I don't feel that way most days, that there's more than enough. I mean, honestly, if I open my fridge up, there's in there, all right? I got some food in the cupboards. I got gas in my truck. I've got clothes that I'm wearing that doesn't have a bunch of holes in them and things like that. I've got a job. Amen there. <laughs> yeah. I haven't said anything stupid so far, <laughs> so I still have that. I've got friends that love me. I've got family. But yet, I just don't know. I still feel like I need more. I need more. And I'm a pastor, right? I'm supposed to be satisfied with minimal. That's what they told us, right? At least in the books that we read, everybody else is a monk. You know, and so 
I feel a little bit guilty too sometimes because I do have, but at the same time, I would like, well, a pool, you know? Amen? Or, you know, unlimited Tony Pacos. <laughs> so, just saying. <laughs> like, I find that inside myself that I am not really any different than you. No matter what you say or do, you feel the same way. That you need more, don't you? And whatever it is, right? It could be food. Because we're, we're talking about gluttony, right? And that's the first thing that went through your mind is food. And I'm here to tell you that's not what it is. I mean, it can be a part. But it also can be other things. In Genesis, way back in the beginning, we see in our Bible, the very first things that we open up, chapters 1 through 3, we see this creator creating something out of nothing. And each time he opens his mouth, something new happens. And when that happens, he says something. It is good. It is good. We get the sun and the stars and the moon. It is good. We get waters and we get islands and we get land. It is good. We get creepy crawly things is what it says. They call them insects. And he says even those are good. And then he comes to us, humankind. And he says, it is very good. And he places us in this giant garden where everything is met. We have no needs. And we are walking with the very creator of everything. Every day. We get to ask questions and be a part of. And explore and hear things that we've never heard before. And this creator looks at us and says, anything you want is yours. Just ask. I want to give it to you. I love giving it to you. Except for this one thing. This particular tree in the middle of this particular garden, I would like for you to stay away. Stay away from it. I'd rather you not even look at it, but definitely don't touch it. Because I can give you everything you ever need. And then it happens, doesn't it? Probably open the refrigerator, it doesn't see the things that we want to see in there. Open up the garage door, maybe the car doesn't look as new as it used to. Our kitchens, our living rooms, our furniture, our clothes, our relationships. And we say the same thing that Adam and Eve say. It's not enough. I need more. I need more. And so they go, and, and I, in, the, in the book, it's real quick, right? They see the tree, they see it happening, and then all of a sudden, you know, the next verse is they're eating it, right? And then God's kind of upset. No, I, I think it's deeper than that. I think maybe years went by. Because that's how Satan works. He plants a seed in you and allows it to grow over and over and whispering to you, it's not enough. It's not enough. You need more. You need more. You need more. Eventually you become mad at it and whatever it is that you think you have to have more of, you go and get it. And like them, they took. And when they took, everything was broken. Jesus would call this gluttony. For the simple fact, it's just gluttony. You have everything you ever need and ever want. And you probably have it right now. Do you have water? That's fresh. Go ahead, ice your hands. There's only a few of you that have water. All right. Amen. Right there, just go ahead and look at somebody and say amen. Yeah. Some of you brushed your teeth this morning. Amen. There it is. Thank you, choir. Amen. Do you have water? Mm. Some of us even have that luxury of our water turns into ice. Oh, that's crazy, isn't it? Do you have food? You have food, yeah. How many of you have a dollar? Huh? You know, you get up to three dollars, you're doing better than most of the world. How's that amazing? You have everything. But yet, inside you, no different than them, the sin has created something oh, that's just dangerous for us to live in. 
See, gluttony is not just about obesity. It's more than obesity. Gluttony is about what we unite ourselves to. All right? It's what we unite ourselves to. I would like to simply say it's our marriage. <laughs> Think of it that way. It's a marriage. That you are marrying something. You're becoming intimate with whatever that it is. And you have exchanged vows with whatever that is. And so you are uniting yourself. That's what gluttony is. Gluttony weds itself um, not just over meals, but it, it, it wants to devour everything more and more and more and more. We all know what gluttony feels like because we've all eaten that extra piece of pizza, right? Or let's be real Thanksgiving. How many of you guys wear the special pants for Thanksgiving? You don't have to raise your hand, all right? You know what I'm talking about, right? You go into that game prepared. Oh, we're going to own this Thanksgiving. And you talk about it all year. See, Stephen Covey once wrote a book. It's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in this, he says, there's three habits of character in this book. And he says, then there's three habits of relationship in this book that he talked about. And then he says the last one, the most important character, is what he called the Saul sharpening trait. It's the one where it takes all the other characters and it sharpens them. And he simply says, without this one, this one trait, all the others become dull and, and useful. Not useful. So bloody is like our saw sharpening tool for our other sins. Now listen to this. Pride, it longs for applause, doesn't it? Amen? It does. But gluttony needs to be the diva in that. Envy covets, covets what others have, but gluttony counts every insignificant detail. It's not enough to be slothful. Gluttony abandons all virtues of excess. Gluttony is the salt when the greedy taste their spoils. One million dollars isn't enough. It must be ten million. Five-year-old wine isn't good enough. It must be 15-year-old in French. And <laughs> yeah. Wrath wants revenge, but gluttony wants to inflict, wants the infliction of it to be creatively painful. It always wants more, 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 more. Gluttony amplifies the other sins and always enhances self-destruction. Like in the garden, when we wanted more and we took it, what happened? The ground became barren. Thorn bushes were grown instead of food. We started treating each other bad. I mean, it wasn't just the fact that a woman was going to have pain and, and childbirth now, but she was always going to have a man over top of her, treating her with disrespect. See, that's what gluttony does. It destroys our relationships. It destroys the very ground on which we are a part of. And it always, always amplifies the one thing you're struggling with. Because it wants more of it. More of it. You know, and lust doesn't just want one woman. It wants them all. It amplifies. It enhances. From Genesis to where Jesus came, we have all these stories of us not being able to treat each other as human beings. And then something happens in the story of John where we see this lady, Mary, the same lady who's a brother to Lazarus, the same Lazarus who was raised from the dead probably not too long ago. I mean, that's a party to go to, isn't it? Don't you think? I mean, if you're going to go somewhere, go to the guy who just rose from the dead kind of party. That guy's going to be up all night, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so there's all, and then you can always be that guy who makes fun of them, you know what I mean? When you walk in, who's this? <laughs> it's Lazarus, yeah. I mean, whatever that looks like in it. But they're at this party, and, 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 and Mary, she, she has this jar of perfume. And, and for us, it doesn't really mean a whole lot, does it? It's just, hey, there's this jar of perfume. She kind of smashes it, rubs it all over Jesus' feet, and then, boom, we have another guy gets angry at her because she did it, right? I mean, it's a real simple story, but it's deeper than that, what Jesus is saying. 
He's saying that she is uniting herself with him. See, she has this perfume. And in this particular perfume, think of it like an heirloom. Something that has been in your family for a very long time, and it's worth a lot of money. I mean, it's worth so much money, it can change your identity and your status with the people you work with and play with. And so it's handed down from one girl to the next girl. And the reason it's handed down is because if everything in the world goes boom, right, you can cash this in and survive. That's the kind of girl you want to marry, guys. Amen? I mean, honestly, if, if you mess up <laughs> providing for the family and everything, you can always take what Mary has, right? Amen? <laughs> and start over. So it's, it's that important for her because this is the, the present in which she's going to present to have a baby someday, to have a relationship someday, to have status in her community someday, to be married maybe someday. And so her whole identity is wrapped into this little jar. Now, for most of us, we would have our little jar, whatever it is, and we want more, don't we? It's not enough just to have that jar. We need to collect another one, don't we? And hold on to it, and hold on to it. And we see that in the story where this, this guy says, hey, why are you doing this? We should sell it for the poor, right? It's really not what he was talking about, was it? See, he was already in charge of the purse. He wanted what? More, more, more. To where Mary took everything she had and united herself to her true love. The one that was going to provide everything for her, just like in the garden again. And so she does a scandalous thing. She breaks it and pours it on his feet and then takes it one step farther by unbounding her hair and wiping it. You only unbound your hair if you're really going to be married to that person. You know what I'm saying? So it's a different type of uniting. She wanted more of God to where we want more of our stuff. And maybe just maybe we're not willing to sacrifice the one thing we hold on to, whatever that is, and break it apart on the ground and give it to Jesus. Whether that's pride, lust, envy, wrath. What is it that you're fighting with? What is it that you want more of? See, in this story, we see again, like I said, one uniting himself to, well, envy, coveting, everything else that goes along with it. To where the other gives everything they have to the one that's going to provide. Whereas the gluttons unite themselves to what will often kill themselves. The persecuted have been united, have been, having been united to Christ will give up even what they need for the sake of their beloved. Now this is tough for me, and because I also know that blessed are those who are persecuted in the name for they will have righteousness. And that's I get that piece, but here's what's going to happen. When you take yourself and you smash it on the ground and give it to God, you will be persecuted. I know this. How many of you have friends? There's like a few, few people have friends. Okay, that's a good thing, all right? If you don't have friends, well, you're with me most times. Ever. All my friends, in 1993, when I gave myself to Christ, when I smashed my jar of self, and I poured myself onto Jesus' feet and gave myself to him, 90% of my friends no longer are my friends. Because they couldn't understand why I was doing what I was doing when I was doing it. And so I'm persecuted in that way. I'm losing stuff for the name of Jesus. Literally, his name, I'm losing stuff. 
I give up certain jobs. I give up certain promotions. I give up this and that. Why? For the name's sake of Christ. Why? Because I believe with all my heart that we are here to serve, not to be served. And when you do that, people will look at you like you have lost your mind. They will. But maybe, just maybe, you'll be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say these simple words, there's more than enough. There's more than enough. I want you to go ahead and try it real quick. Look at somebody and say, there's more than enough. Man, you guys did not do that well. <laughs> do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you have water? Amen. Do you have gas in your car? Amen. Do you have more than two dollars? Amen. There's more than enough. There's more than enough. We can either live a bloodless life and unite ourselves to it, or we can unite ourselves to Christ. It's all about marriage. What will you commit yourself to? Because I believe in those last moments when Jesus is looking at her and he's saying what he is saying to them, what she is hearing is those wedding vows. Do you believe in me? Do you believe? Do you commit to this relationship? Will you be united with me forever? Some of us have taken those vows in our own marriages, but maybe today this is the vow you need to take with God. Do you believe in God? You can simply say, I do. Will you commit to this relationship? I would. Will you always be united with me? I will. Now who's going to throw the flowers? Amen? Somebody's got to throw the flowers, right? Because this wedding just happened. sing a song and uh, but before we sing that I want to bring up somebody I believe is part of our, our teams that believe in giving when giving needs to be given and working behind the scenes when work needs to be done and she's got a whole crew of people and, and I told Barb where she go she really leave all right all right I told her she I was gonna bring her up so come on up here Barb I'm very proud I guess I'm not allowed to say pride, right? Very humble. <laughs> that we have people like Barb in our midst. And she's got a whole crew of people that do missions. And so you gotta come on up here like, all the way. All the way. That's because you're on Facebook Live right now. <laughs> so, <there it> Barb is a <laughs> uh, part of our missions team and um, they're doing great things. And one of the big things they've just done is part of our Freedom School. And um, I believe we're able to give, with your giving and their giving, um, $2,000, which is enough to have um, two kids, right? Yep, two kids go all summer to this special school for reading and other things. And then Barb's like, hey, um, I want more. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I don't know if that's bloody, you know, but she's like, hey, can we do some more? And one of them is that um, we're going to be able to serve some dinners um, down there. And if you are interested, and maybe this is your first step of serving others before self. This could be it. We would love to be able to give Barb all the help she needs in serving some of these dinners. And maybe, just maybe, you're saying to yourself, you know what, I want to be a part of a team that helps others. This is the young lady that you need to go see. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's pray over Barb and her team as they get ready for the summer to do some great stuff. If you can, just hold a hand up towards her. All right? Heavenly Father, again, I thank you for the blessings of Barb and her team uh, and all the behind-the-scenes stuff they do. How they are the example to teach us how not to be gluttonous for the things that we have, but to always give to others. Lord, look after her and her team this summer as they really get into it. Uh, Lord, allow their hands to be dirty, but their hearts to be open. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Go ahead and give her and her team a big hand. Thank you. Yeah,